TQM's focus on customer satisfaction rests on two pillars, continuous improvement and employee involvement. Continuous improvement is sometimes thought to mean only incremental improvement, but it really means that we never stop reinventing ourselves. We want to put in motion a vigorous mechanism of continuous improvement that includes hundreds of incremental improvements as well as some large ones. Every day we are looking for ways to improve what we are doing and how we are doing it. If we are able to stay ahead of the competition, we will have a satisfied customer. Keep in mind that we are not only talking about staying ahead in terms of service or product design improvements, but also in terms of quality improvements, as well as cost effectiveness or productivity improvements. The Japanese term for continuous improvement, Kaizen, is often applied in the context of process improvements, not just quality improvements. Even though we might use the label of quality management, if we are really constantly looking for ways to improve our processes, what are the odds that only quality improvements will ensue? Are we going to say, no, that's a productivity improvement, we don't want it? The TQM framework employs a problem-solving method known as the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle, or PDCA. This is sometimes also called the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle, or PDSA. The underlying principle is quite simple. We identify an area or process that needs improvement and plan an intervention. Then we do the intervention. Then we watch the process closely and check or study it, assess the results, and reevaluate. If we like what we see, we act on the improvement and roll it out as the standard procedure. When we are finished, we move on to the next area that needs improvement and repeat the PDCA cycle. As you can see, this method doesn't sound like rocket science. But that's like saying there's nothing great about lighting a campfire. Just put a few logs together and strike a match. Have you gone camping and tried that on a damp morning? Good thing you're on vacation and have all day. Maybe you can throw in some old newspapers to help, but did you remember to bring a wagon load of papers? The idea is not just to light a small flame that dies out soon enough. The trick is in getting it to become a roaring fire and self-sustaining so that even if you throw a damp log on it, it just burps and swallows it up. Likewise, with continuous improvement also, the trick is in getting the PDCA process to be a vigorous self-sustaining mechanism. Another version of the continuous improvement cycle is called the Six Sigma Improvement Model. We have seen that Six Sigma capability means that a process is able to fit, within the customer's specifications, six standard deviations on either side of the mean. Such a process produces two defects in a billion. This is the ideal state that we would like all our processes to achieve. In the context of continuous improvement, we see another use of the term Six Sigma. Here we are talking about the improvement methodology we can use in order to attain that ideal state of Six Sigma capability. This Six Sigma model follows the define, measure, analyze, improve, control cycle, or DMAIC. First, we define the problem, or the gap between the current state and the desired state. Then we collect data and measure the process gap. Then we analyze the process and see what changes are necessary. Then we improve the process and implement the changes. Finally, we control the process and monitor it to ensure that it is behaving as desired. Any continuous improvement model, PDCA, Kaizen, Six Sigma, requires the dedication of resources committed to process improvement. Otherwise, asking for improvement is like asking an overburdened pair of oxen to redesign the cart they are pulling, while they are pulling it, with the intention that once they reduce the friction, only one ox will be required and the other one can be disposed of. To facilitate continuous improvement, it is necessary to set aside time for regular employees to get engaged in the process. 
The bulk of improvement suggestions are going to come from the employees who are actually conducting the process, not some managers or external consultants. In addition, you also need a cadre of persons who have expertise in process analysis and problem solving tools. These persons can be made available as internal consultants to the process improvement teams. Note here that their role is not to find a solution which management will then impose. Rather, finding a solution is the role of the improvement team consisting of process employees. These consulting experts are merely facilitators and providers of advice. With TQM, such experts can often be found among the quality management personnel who can trade in their role as COPs to take on the role of process improvement consultants. The Six Sigma Improvement Model more methodically builds in such a cadre of internal consultants at different levels, with each given a karate label. Green belts spend a part of their time on improvement projects. Black belts work full time on improvement projects. Master black belts are mentors and resources for the black belts themselves. Employee involvement is the second pillar of TQM. The total in TQM depends on every employee taking ownership of the process. An involved employee is one who brings his or her brain as well as heart to work, which is a prerequisite for a vigorous continuous improvement mechanism. Conversely, without such involvement, we have the it's not my job syndrome. Now, it is easy to find fault with this employee, of course. But if we look at the situation more deeply, you can be quite certain that it was inept management practices that led to such employee behavior. Here is an employee who has been encouraged over the years to check his or her brain and heart at the door before coming into work. An important truism in quality management is, management is responsible for over 95% of the problems and quality defects. Even though the employee seems to be the one producing the defect, who is responsible for setting up the processes that the employee is using? Wait a minute, but what if the employee came into work drunk? Is management still responsible for the employee's actions? Yes and no. The employee must be held accountable, of course. However, what went wrong with our recruitment process that we hired the wrong employee? What went wrong with our training process that we didn't train against such behaviors? What went wrong with our reward process that the employee would still engage in such behavior? What went wrong with our team building process that the employee's team members didn't put an end to such a behavior? What went wrong with our acculturation process that the employee didn't understand that such behavior is a big no-no in our work culture? Or perhaps the employee does understand our work culture very well, that we are really a bunch of slobs. We only put up nice slogans, but never practice anything. That is inept management. Employee involvement involves four kinds of practices. Power sharing practices involve a devolution of decision making authority down to the lowest possible level. Power sharing can involve structural changes such as participatory management, flatter organization structures, self-managed teams, etc. It can also involve job rotation, job enlargement, or adding upstream or downstream tasks at a similar level, job enrichment, or increasing the skill variety and task significance, etc. Information sharing practices involve providing employees with greater access to information, especially that which is necessary for their involvement in decision making and process improvement. Greater information sharing can also combat the us versus them mentality that pits management versus labor. It can also increase an employee's sense of belonging and ownership, which puts the total in TQM. Information also flows in the other direction via feedback systems that gather employee comments and suggestions, 
which is crucial for continuous improvement. Training practices involve employee development in job-related skills, of course. Before you can even think of devolving decision-making authority to an employee, it is essential that the employee have the requisite job skills training. More importantly, from a continuous improvement perspective, training in cross-functional skills, problem-solving skills, leadership skills, and team-building skills also become very important. As well, training in general business skills, together with information about the company's operations, is important in elevating an employee's attitude from, I am just an inconsequential cog in this huge mechanism. That mentality goes hand in hand with, I don't care, and it's not my job. Finally, all of the above practices hinge on appropriate reward practices. If we want employees to think beyond their narrow boxes and to feel a sense of ownership of the process, the reward practices should also be geared towards encouraging such thinking. We need rewards that encourage power sharing, continuous improvement, acceptance of change, and acquisition of training for that purpose. Knowledge or skill-based pay, non-monetary rewards, incentives based on improvement, etc. become important. Rewards that encourage thinking about the greater welfare of the organization are also important, such as team-based incentives, profit sharing, gain sharing, etc.